In this presentation, we will consider the words of the Savior in the book of Philippians, chapters 1 through 4. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. Introduction to the epistle of, of Paul, the apostle to the Philippians. In his epistle to the Philippians, Paul gave the saints in Philippi encouragement and exhorted them to stand fast in the faith. Paul also exhorted the saints to claim the unifying and exalting blessings that would come from humbling themselves. Perhaps one of the most important principles taught Paul, Paul taught in Philippians is that trusting in the Lord brings the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Paul's messages of encouragement in this epistle can help motivate modern readers in their personal efforts to endure faithfully. As members of the church strive to follow Christ, they, can, they too can gain confidence and, like Paul declare, I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. Philippians, often called a prison epistle, along with Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. It is traditionally thought that Paul wrote Philippians while he was imprisoned in Rome from AD 60 to 62. Paul had previously been imprisoned in Caesarea and Ephesus, Ephesus, I'm sorry for that. Philippi was the first place in Europe where Paul formally preached the gospel and established a branch of the church. One, person for Paul's, one purpose for Paul's writing this letter was to express gratitude for, for the affection and financial assistance the saints in Philippi had extended to him during his second minister missionary journey. Paul also praised the members in Philippi for their faith in Christ and gave them counsel based on information about the city that they had received from a Philippian disciple named Epaphroditus. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. Paul also warned the Philippians to beware of corrupt Christians, such as those who taught that circumcision was needed for conversion. Such individuals were known as Judaizers, who falsely claimed that new converts had to submit to the former Old Testament law of circumcision before becoming Christian. That's in Philippians 3, 2-3. Philippians is not a mighty dissertation, one to shake the earth or, sever as a, or serve as a guidepost to Christendom, but it is a sweet and refined statement into which a number of gospel doctrines are woven, and our Bible is greatly enriched by its presence here there. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1 now. All has happened to Paul has furthered the gospel of God. All that has happened to Paul as further the gospel cause. Philippians 1.1 1, 1, Saints Faithful members of the church and kingdom of God on earth are called saints, a title to signifying that they have been cleansed by baptism and are pure and clean before the Lord. Ancient Israel, for instance, consisted of a congregation of saints, you can see that in Psalms 149.1, 1, and the term is one of the most frequently used designation of the Lord's people. Paul, in speaking of the second coming of our Lord, pointedly recorded that, that the true believers in the last days would be called saints. For Christ's sake, for Christ shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe. The only true saints in this day are thus members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Saints are named nearly 40 times in the Old Testament, over 60 times in the New Testament, and about 30 times in the Book of Mormon, and over 70 times in the Doctrine and Covenants. The plan of salvation consists in putting off the natural man, who is an enemy to God, and in becoming a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Saints are submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him. Mosiah 3.19 The saints from the beginning on down, who had preceded our Lord in death, were with him in his resurrection. Saints who have lived since then will be resurrected in the, first, in the coming first resurrection will be with Christ in the great events 
incident to his second coming, and finally all saints shall dwell with God. President Russell M. Nelson gave 12, gives 12 attributes of what makes up a saint. One, he is a believer in Christ and knows of his love. Two, serves others. Three, is tolerant and attentive to others. Four, responds, what I do care versus what do I care. Five, refrains from idleness, seeks learning. Six, is honest, paying financial obligations, treating others as he would want to be. Seven, is an honorable citizen. Eight, resolves any differences with other honorable, with other honorably and peacefully. Nine, shuns that which is unclean. Ten, avoids excess, even that which is good. Eleven, is reverent to Lord leaders, law, and chapels. Twelve, one who receives the gifts of the Spirit. That was in General Conference of March of 1990. Philippians 1, 2-14, Paul's imprisonment results in the furtherance of the gospel. Paul opened his epistle with a tender and loving greeting to the Philippian saints. He then pointed out some positive consequences that had come from his imprisonment, specifically the furtherance of the gospel. The Greek term translated of furtherance can also refer to an army's cutting away of undergrowth or removing other barriers that impede their progress. Apparently, Paul's situation removed impediments to the spreading of the gospel as his bonds in Christ became known in the palace or military, military headquarters. In addition, other church members drew courage from Paul's example and became much more bold to speak the word. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 11, Christ shows his love towards the saints through Paul. Paul hopes the saints will perpetuate this love. Verse one, Chapter 1, verse 12, unto the furtherance of the gospel. Compare this to Doctrine and Covenants 1, verse 7, which says, And if thou should be cast into the pit, or into the hands of murders, and the sentence of death pass upon thee, if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if, first wind, if fierce winds become thy enemy, if the heavens gather blackness and all the elements combine to hedge up thy way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open thy mouth wide after thee, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. This was the Savior speaking Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail. The Lord, that was the end of 122.7. The Lord's hand is in all things. He governs and controls the spread and triumph of his gospel. Persecution, imprisonment, war, and worldly conditions of every sort are used by him for his purposes, for the spread of truth, for the testing of the saints, for the ultimate salvation of all who will be saved. So even our trials and afflictions can be for the furtherance of the gospel in our own lives. Philippians 1, 15-20, Two Ways of Preaching Paul identified two ways of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. One way is to preach with strife and contention, without sincerity. That's Philippians 1, 15-16. The second, better way, is to preach with goodwill and love, Philippians 1, 15 and 17. Philippians 1, 15 through 18, the preaching of Christ. Christ is many things. He is a God of vengeance to the wicked, of loving kindness to his saints. He is a man of war on one occasion, a prince of peace on another. His message is death to the wicked, life to the righteous. His voice is one of condemnation to some, of praise to others. Who then is the Christ of whom his servants should preach? Obviously, there's only one way for any preachers to know what perspective to take on any given occasion, and that is to receive the revelation from Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. There is no other way to say what he would say if he personally were the preacher, which is the same thing as saying he wants said in any given situation. 
When this spirit of inspiration is lost, the end result is apostasy. With professing ministers choosing their own fields of emphasis, thus preaching conflicting gospels and crying, Lo, here is Christ, or Lo, there, as in the case in the sectarian world today. Philippians 1, 21-25, I am in a strait betwixt two. While he was detained in prison, Paul was caught between two competing desires, a desire for death, which would allow him to be with the Savior, and the desire to live and continue to serve him. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles observed, Paul did not fear death, as with others who have fought the good fight and overcome the world, he desired to be relieved of the burdens of mortality and rest in the paradise of God. Yet his sense of duty caused him to know his ministry here was not over, that though his own salvation was assured, he must remain in the flesh and work further for the salvation of his fellow saints. The Book of Mormon Prophet Mormon similarly expressed to his son Moroni a duty to preach the gospel while he remained alive in this tabernacle of clay. Moroni 9.6 Philippians 1, 26 through 30. Chapter 1, verse 26 is the exaltation of the Philippians in the apostles' escape and resulting gain to the Christian cause. Verse 27 of chapter 1. Let your conversations be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, meaning let your conduct conform to gospel standards. Keep the commandments. Stand fast in our spirits, he meant, each of, your, each of you exemplify the same spirit of love, of charity, of mercy, of godliness. With one mind, Paul meant, believing the same truth, thinking the same thoughts, having the same hopes. Striving together for the faith of the gospel, meant, laboring to gain that power, faith, which comes from gospel obedience. Chapter 1, verse 28, steadfastness meant, especially for this church, not to be daunted by persecution. They are Paul's comrades in the conflict which he underwent at Philippi formerly and now endures, endures in Rome. Verse 30, the Joseph Smith translation of verse 28 makes this more plain. Quoting the Joseph Smith translation, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries who reject the gospel which bringeth on them destruction, but you who receive the gospel, salvation, and that of God. Chapter 1, verse 29, the phrase, in the behalf of Christ to suffer, meaning, when the saints suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, they stand in the place instead of Christ and are receiving what the ungodly would heap upon the Son of God were he personally present. Philippians chapter 2, saints should be of one mind and one spirit. I'm sorry, this should be Philippians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 2. I don't know how I missed that. Becoming one, meaning if you have found consolation in Christ, if you have gained comfort in his love, if you have fellowship with the Holy Ghost, if you have tasted the mercy of God, then exemplify that unity which becometh the saints of God. If we are to be true saints of God and establish Zion, then we must become of one heart and one mind, Moses 7, 18. That is, being one in heart and mind with the heart and mind of the Savior. Brigham Young stated, quote, Let all persons be fervent in prayer until they know the things of God for themselves and become certain that they are walking in the path that leads to everlasting life. Then will envy, the child of ignorance, vanish, and there will be no disposition in any man to place himself above another. For such a feeling meets no countenance in the order of heaven. Jesus Christ never wanted to be different from his Father. 
They were and are one. If a people are led by the revelations of Jesus Christ and they are cognizant of the fact through their faithfulness, there is no fear, but they will be one in Jesus Christ and see eye to eye. End of quote. Again, this should be Philippians 2, chap, verses 3 through 4. I must... I, I must have gotten uh, carried away with 2 Corinthians, and I didn't catch that when I was pre-reading this. Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Such oneness of soul means doing nothing in a fictitious or vainglorious way, each man in loneliness of mind continuing the other better than himself from keeping an eye not on his own interests but for those of his neighbor. In short... Love and humility together overcome all dis divisive influences and bring about the perfect so socialism of the spirit. This is in keeping with D&C 38, 24-27, which says, And let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And again I say unto you, Let every man esteem his brother as himself. For what man among you, having twelve sons, and is no respecter of them, and they serve him obediently, and he say unto the one, Be thou clothed in robes, and sit thou here, and to the other, Be thou clothed in rags, and sit thou there, and looketh upon his sons, and saith, I am just. Behold, this I give unto you as a parable, and it is even as I am. I say unto you, Be one, and if ye are not one, ye are not one, mine. And the only way, brothers and sisters, we are going to become one is if we become one in Jesus Christ. Oh, again, Philippians. This should be Philippians. I thought I corrected all of these as I proofread. Philippians 2, 5 through 6. Though it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 5, our minds and hearts need to be grounded in the mind and heart of God, which Jesus being the great example of unity with his Father. Verse 6, wherein then lives our Lord's equality with his God and our God? Is it not in that Jesus, crowned now himself with exaltation, was received from the Father all knowledge, all truth, all wisdom, and all power? Is it not in the same sense that all of the sons of God, as joint heirs with Christ, shall receive all that the Father hath? Is it not in that, treading in the tracks of the Father, those who are adopted at his Son gain exaltation of their own? President Lorenzo Snow, in his, early, in his ministry, received by direct personal revelation knowledge that, in the prophet Joseph Smith's language, God himself was once as we are now, and as an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens, and that men have got to learn how to be gods, the same as all gods have done before. That's some teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, pages 345 to 346. After this glorious doctrine had been taught by the prophet, Joe, President Snow felt free to teach it also and to summarize it in a couplet form by saying, which is very famous in the church, as man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. In amplifying the thought in this couplet in direct response to Paul's declaration in these verses, and also referring to 1 John 3, 1-3, President Snow penned this reply to the Apostle of old in a poem he wrote, Dear brother, hast thou not been unwisely bold, man's destiny to thus unfold, to praise promote such high desire, such vast ambition thus inspire? Still tis no phantom that we trace, man's ultimate in life's race. This royal path has long been trod by righteous men, each now a god. As Abram, Isaac, Jacob, too, first babes, then men, to gods they grew. As man now is, our god once was, as now god is, man, so man may be. 
which doth unfold man's destiny. For John declares, when Christ we see, like unto him will truly be. And he who has this hope within will purify himself from sin, who keep this object grand in view, to folly sin will bid adieu, nor wallow in the mire anew, nor ever seek to carve his name high on the shaft of worldly fame, but hear his ultimatum trace, the head of all his spirit race. Ah, well, thou that taught by you, dear Paul, though much amazed we see it all. Our Father God has opened our eyes. We cannot view it otherwise. The boy, like to his father grown, has but attained unto his own. To grow to sire from state to son is not against nature's course to run. A son of God like God to be would not be robbing deity. And he who has this hope within will purify himself from sin. You're right, St. John, supremely right, who are essay to climb this height, will cleanse himself of in sin entire, or else twere needless to aspire. That was Lorenzo Snow. Again, this should be Philippians instead of Second Corinthians. I apologize. Apologize for <clears throat> not catching these uh, corrections. I will change that. Oh, again, I don't know what happened with, I must have got caught up in 2 Corinthians. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, the work of Christ. Christ is the source of salvation for all men. Through him, immortality and eternal life come. But he also had a work to he had to work out his own salvation, to serve immortality, to humble himself before the Father, to keep the commandments, to endure to the end. When the Savior was born into mortality, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Jesus Christ gave up his premortal status in the form of God and was born into mortality in the likeness of men. In the Book of Mormon, the idea of Christ descending below all things is called the condescension, the condescension of God. Elder Neil A. Maxwell teaches us, At the end, meek and lowly Jesus partook of the most bitter cup without becoming the least bitter. The most innocent one suffered the most. Yet the king of kings did not break even when some of his subjects did to him as they listed. Christ's unyielding capacity to endure such irony was truly remarkable. You and I are so much more brittle. For instance, we forget that by very nature many tests seem unfair. In heaven, Christ's lofty name was determined to be the only name on earth offering salvation to all mankind. Yet the King of Kings, the mortal Messiah, willingly lived modestly, wrote Paul, even as a person of no reputation. What a great example of humility Christ is to us. What a contrast, continuing Elder Maxwell, to our maneuvering, our relative recognition and comparative status. How different, too, from the ways in which some among us mistakenly sees, see the size and response of their audiences as the sole verification of their worth. Yet those fickle galleries to which we sometimes play have a way of being rotated and emptied. They will surely be empty on Judgment Day. 
everyone will be somewhere else on their knees. Oh, again, Philippians. I do not know how I missed and put 2 Corinthians upon these. Philippians chapter 2, 7 through 8 continued. According to Elder Tad R. Collister, the 70, God the Son traded his heavenly home with all its celestial adornments for a mortal abode with all its primitive trappings. He, the King of heaven, the Lord omnipotent who reigneth, left a throne to inherit a manger. He exchanged the dominion of a God for the dependency of a babe. He gave up wealth, power, dominion, and the fullness of his glory. For what? For taunting, mocking, humiliation, and subjection. It was a trade of unparalleled dimension, a condescension of incredible proportions, a descent of incalculable depth. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Wherefore, indeed, God more highly exalted him and granted to him the name that is above every name. This name is the complete title, the Lord Jesus Christ, under which our Savior will be adorned throughout the universe. Things under the earth was a Greek euphemism for the dead appropriated for Jesus' language of Isaiah 45:23 which foretold the worship to be paid to Israel's God by all mankind. The glory of the Father will be realized in the universal acknowledgement of the Lordship of the Son whom he enthroned. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gives these insights. No con con tongue can tell, no person can write, no man can utter, no human mind can conceive of the glory, majesty, might, power, and dominion that is Christ. He is the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and all that is in them is, the eternal Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel, the Savior and Redeemer. He made the earth, salvation comes by him, his atoning sacrifice is infinite and eternal. Hear, O ye heavens, and give ear, O earth, and rejoice, O ye inhabitants therefore, thereof. For the Lord is God, and besides him there is no Savior. Great is his wisdom, and marvelous are his ways, and the extent of his doings none can find out. His purposes fell not, neither are they any who can stay his hand from eternity to eternity. He is the same, and his years never faileth. Elder McConkie was quoting Dr. Covenant 76, 1 through 4. Continuing Elder McConkie, Since Christ is the Savior, since all things pertain to life and salvation center in him, since he is God, it follows that all men must turn to him and his gospel for salvation, and that in his own due time he shall receive the worship and adoration of all men. How appropriate, then, for Paul knowing that the Lord Jesus was the Lord Jehovah to apply Isaiah's, Isaiah 45, 23, pronouncement to Christ. And how appropriate also for Christ himself to say to Joseph Smith that when he shall have subdued all enemies under his feet, then shall he be crowned with the crowns of his glory, to sit on the throne of his power, to reign forever and ever, and to add, speaking of celestial hosts, whose numbers shall be as the stars in the firmament of heaven, or as the sand upon the seashore, <clears throat> that these are they who are cast down to hell and suffer the wrath of Almighty God, until the fullness of times when Christ shall have subdued all enemies under his feet, and shall have perfected his work when he shall deliver up the kingdom and present it unto the Father, spotless, saying, I have overcome and have trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Then shall he be crowned with the crown of his glory, 
to sit on the throne of his power, to reign forever and ever. But behold and lo, we saw the glory and the inhabitants of the telestial world, that they were as innumerable as the stars in the firmament of heaven, or as the sand upon the seashore, and heard the voice of the Lord saying, These all shall bow the knee, and every tongue shall confess to him who sits upon the throne forever and ever. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 106 through 110. Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Work out your own salvation, for it is God which worketh in you. Paul told the Philippian saints, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some people incorrectly use this verse to support the idea that we are saved by our own efforts and not by the grace of Jesus Christ. However, Paul was not telling the saints to work in order to earn salvation. Instead, as Paul pointed out, the saints should live the gospel so that the saving work God has already doing with them would be manifested in all they did. Our effort to work our out our salvation are possible only because of the Lord's grace within us. When Paul said to act with fear and trembling, he did not mean that we should be afraid or worried. Instead, he meant that we should serve the Lord with awe and reverence, and that we should tremble with eagerness to work out our salvation. President Dallin H. Oaks, the first president, expounded on this statement. The Apostle Paul wrote that we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Could that familiar expression mean that the sum total of our own righteousness will win, uh, will win us salvation and exaltation solely on our own merits? On the basis of what I have heard, I believe that some of us, some of the time, say things that can create that impression. We can forget that keeping the commandments, which is necessary, is not sufficient. As Nephi said, we must labor diligently to persuade everyone to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Man unquestionably has impressive powers and can bring to pass great things by tireless efforts and indomitable will. But after all our obedience and good works, we cannot be saved from the effect of our sins without the grace extended by the atonement of Jesus Christ. End of President Oaks quote. Philippians 2, 14 through 17, verse 14, the consciousness of God's sovereign grace operating in the Philippian Christians will prevent their work from being marred by murmurings and reasonings against their lot. Verse 15, Paul was saying, in this confidence they will bear themselves as God's children amid an evil world where they are set to shine as luminaries, holding forth in its luster the word of life. For salvation seeking is not egoism. Christian excellence is that of a lamp, the most radiant as it is better trimmed. Verse 16, the writer too will gain much by the advancing salvation and luminous witness of his converts. This will be for a glorifying to myself against the day of Christ as showing that I have not run in vain nor toiled in vain. Verse 17, Paul was saying, supposing the worst fears of the Philippians realized by his condemn condemnation to the death, their faith will turn this into glad offering an apostle's part to God. Philippians 18 through 24 in chapter 2. Verse 18, even in this issue, he rejoices and rejoices with them and calls on them to rejoice and rejoice with him. Verses 19 to 20. Paul will send Timothy forthwith to Philippi so soon as the outlook is clear. The motive for sending is that I too, as well as you, may be of good cheer through learning the news about you, as you through hearing about me. And the reasons for sending Timothy are, on the one hand, his genuine care for the Philippians and the absence of anyone else like-minded. Verses 21 and 22. 
Some of his companions were busy elsewhere. Others declined the errand through motives that he regards as selfish. Not all in the world, or even the church, seek the welfare of others in Christ. But they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way after the image of his own God. But the Philippians can trust Timotheus as a true minister of Christ. Verses 23 and 24. For Paul hopes to also come to Philipp Philippi, Philippi, Philippi with Timotheus. Philippians 2, 25-30 Ephroditus was a noble emissary to Paul. He had served valiantly with Paul and had greatly assisted in the work, but he had been sick, even nigh unto death, verses 27 and 30, and had become a little discouraged when his Philippian friends heard about his illness and worried about him. Paul sent him home with his high commendation. Philippians chapter 3, Paul sacrifices all things for Christ. Sacrifice the crowning test of the gospel. Men are tried and tested in this mortal probation to see if they will put first in their lives the things of the kingdom of God. To gain eternal life, they must be willing, if called upon, to sacrifice all things for the gospel. For if thou wert perfect, Jesus said to the rich young man, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Hearing this injunction, Peter said, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? To this query our Lord replied, Everyone that hath forsaken house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. This reminds me of a story L. President Hinckley gave in general conference about a Pakistani naval officer who was sent to the United States for training in the military, and he just happened to be sent to Utah for this military training. And while here, this Muslim Pakistani naval officer was converted and joined the church and became a member. And upon hearing about it, President Hinckley talked with this young man and said, Now that you have become converted a Christian, and especially a Mormon Christian, you will most likely go home and be shunned by your family, probably demoted in rank, if not kicked out of the military itself. Are you really willing to make such a sacrifice? And the Pakistani naval officer said, Well, it's true, isn't it? And President Hinckley responded, yes. And then the Pakistan and naval officer said, then what else is there? Joseph Smith taught the law of sacrifice in these words. For a man to lay down his all, his character and reputation, his honor and applause, his good name among men, his houses, his land, his brothers and sisters, his wife and children, and even his own life, counting all things but filth and dross for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, requires more than mere belief or supposition that he is doing the will of God, but actual knowledge, realizing that when these sufferings are ended, he will enter into eternal rest and be a partaker of the glory of God. A religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce faith necessary to lead unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. When a man has offered in sacrifice all that he has for the true sake, not even withholding his life and believing before God that he has been called to make this sacrifice because he seeks to do his will, he does know most assuredly that God does and will accept his sacrifice and offering. 
and that he has not, nor will not seek his face in vain. Under these circumstances, then, he can obtain the faith necessary for him to lay hold on eternal life. Joseph Smith continues, It is vain for persons to fancy to themselves that they are heirs with those, or can be heirs with them, who have offered their all on sacrifice, and by this means obtain faith in God and favor with them, so as obtain eternal life, unless they, in like manner, offer unto him the same sacrifice, and through that offering obtain the knowledge that they are accepted of him. Brothers and sisters, do you think we will really be with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and live with them in exaltation if we have not made like sacrifices? Not meaning doing the exact same thing, but giving up all for Christ as they did? Continuing Joseph Smith, from the days of righteous Abel to the present time, the knowledge that men have that they are accepted in the sight of God is obtained by offering sacrifice. Those then who make the sacrifice will have the testimony that their course is pleasing in the sight of God. And those who have this testimony will have faith to lay hold on eternal life and will be enabled through faith to endure unto the end and receive the crown that is laid up for them that the love, the appearing of the Lord Jesus, laid up for them that love, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not make the sacrifice cannot enjoy this faith because men are dependent upon this sacrifice in order to obtain this faith. Therefore, they cannot lay hold upon eternal life because the revelations of God do not guarantee unto them the authority to do so to do. And without this guarantee, faith could not exist. That is from Lectures on Faith, pages 58 through 60. We must be willing to submit our will completely to the will of the Father, if we are going to gain the faith necessary to gain exaltation. Philippians 3, 1 through 3, beware. Verse 2, beware of Jewish circumcision, which presupposes acceptance of the whole law of Moses and the rejection of Christ, and is in fact nothing more than the cutting of the flesh. Verse 2, the phrase beware of dogs, evil workers, the concision, Paul meant those who advocate circumcision as a saving ordinance. They are as dogs who rage against the truth and seek to devour the saints. The concision, meaning the cutting mutilation of the flesh by circumcision, such a cutting, the apostle teaches, has no more saving virtue than any mutilation of the body. You need to remember that the Jewish converts to Christianity are having a hard time letting go of the law of Moses and of circumcision, and they're trying to mix the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is done away with the law of Moses, they're trying to mix that with the law of Moses, and Paul is trying to teach against that. Verse 3, remember the true circumcision is of the Spirit and includes acceptance of Christ and his gospel. The reasoning is that those who accept the true circumcision anciently possess the same spirit of worship as those who now accept Christ and his gospel. In sarcasm, Paul referred to Judaizers as the concision, a term that implies mutilation. On the other hand, Paul used the circumcision, a term he often used to refer to Jews, to instead refer to God's covenant people, Christians. Thus, those who worship God and rejoice in Christ are the real circumcision or covenant people. To cut out the natural man, just like circumcision was cutting off a piece of the flesh, spiritual circumcision under the gospel of Christ is cutting out the natural man out of your heart and getting rid of it and replacing it with the humility and submission of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verses, I'm sorry, verses 4 through 11. Verses 4 through 7, Paul is saying, If salvation came by Jewish formula, by birth in Israel, by circum of the flesh, by blameless conformity to Mosaic law and ritual, by the common practice of persecuting the church, then Paul had few peers. 
but rather, he says, he has forsaken all things to gain Christ. See, there's where he's trying to say that you, the law of Moses is done. We're through. You need to give it up. Verse 8, the loss of all things, Paul was saying, Paul's family, a Pharisee persecution, Paul's family of forsake per, per, persuasion likely considered him apostate and disowned him. Having sacrificed all for Christ, Paul is now ready to suffer and die as his Lord had done, that he might thereby gain a part in the resurrection of the just. In verse 9, he is saying he no longer has the supposed righteousness that comes from the Mosaic obedience, but now strives for the true righteousness which flows from the faith of Christ. Verses 10 through 11, three points are specified in Paul's knowledge of Christ. First, the power of his resurrection, which came on Saul in, Damasc in the Damascus Revelation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was manifested him as the Son of God at the same time revealed in him the power of God working unto salvation. The whole faith of the gospel turned upon Christ. The new life of the believer springs from his opened grave. Second, in contrast with the power of the Lord's resurrection, life stands Resurrected life stands the fellowship of his sufferings, to which Paul was admitted from the outset. The present situation sets his ministry in this light. This fellowship goes to the length of being conformed to his death, a continued process. For the disciple is following his cross-bearing master Christ, and his daily course is as much is as a march to Calvary. Just as Christ took upon him his cross, we are to bear our crosses and take our march to Calvary and get rid of our sins. Third, Paul's knowledge of Christ will culminate in his attaining unto arriving at the full or final resurrection to the dead, where whitherto he knows in part, then he will know as he is known. If by any means bespeaks humility rather than misgiving, Paul cannot look with steady eye on the dazzling prospect. For a resurrection, a unique intensive Greek compound is used here, signifying completeness, finality, a resurrection that leaves mortality forever behind. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, I press forward, I press toward the mark. Paul said that he followed after, meaning he pressed forward. See footnote B of Philippians 3.12. So that he might apprehend, meaning take hold of or obtain eternal life. Paul also spoke of reaching forth unto those things which are before and pressing toward the mark for the prize. Some of the imagery in these verses reflect the idea of a race where runners continually press on while always focusing on the finishing line. Paul declared that although he had not yet reached his final goal, he had left his past behind and was pressing forward toward the mark, the prize of salvation offered by Jesus Christ. Regarding this attitude, President Thomas S. Monson counseled, there is no going back but only forward. Rather than dwelling on the past, we should make the most of today, of the here, the now, doing all we can. Paul does not promote push-button salvation. He knows that salvation is a long, hard struggle. Nor does he consider that he has already arrived at ultimate perfection himself. He will continue to press forward to eventually win the prize of the high calling of God. End of quote. Philippians 3, 15 through 21. Verse 15, some members of the church are otherwise minded, unable to follow what Paul has just said. Knowing their loyalty, he can wait confidently for their enlightenment. God revealed this also unto you, provided that they faithfully practice the truth already grasped. Verses 16 to 17, Paul was saying all saints should seek salvation in the same way Paul does. The phrase, be followers of me. 
as with Christ, so with his ministers, those who stand in his place and stead in administering life and salvation to men are all, all our exemplars. How many souls have been saved because a righteous man has been able to say with Christ, Come, follow me. Verse 18, Paul is saying, Their character is notor notorious. The apostle, Paul, the apostle has spoken of them often and weeps over them as he writes now. They are particularly the enemies of the cross of Christ, not Jews who stumble at the cross, but professed Christians who walk tens to its subversion. Verse 19, Whose God is their belly? They honor sensual appetites, which is symbolic of the appetites and passions of the flesh, like a god. Verses 20 and 21, resurrected bodies of the saints will be fashioned after Christ. So you can see some in Philippians have apostatized and are falling after the lust of the flesh. And Paul weeps over that. Philippians chapter 4, stand fast in the Lord. Philippians 4.1, Paul's reoccurring, repetitious, never-ending counsel to the saints is, keep the commandments, live the gospel, obey the law, stand fast in the faith. It is, he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Doctrine and Covenants 59.23. Philippians 4.2, apparently two sisters seem to have had some disagreement in the Philippi branch of the church. Philippians 4.3, women which labor with me. Paul expressed tender feelings towards certain women who assisted him in the Lord's work, whom he considered his equals. He exhorted the Philippian saints, help those women which labor with me in the gospel. President J. Reuben Clark, Jr. of the First Presidency expressed similar feelings toward the sacrifices of women in the Latter-day Church. From New Testament times until now, woman has comforted and nursed the church. She has borne more than half the burdens. She has made more than half the sacrifices. She has suffered the most of the heartaches and sorrows. End of quote. Clement is not mentioned elsewhere in the Nis in the New Testament. Early church scholar Origen, Eusebius of Caesarea, and Ephianaeus and Jerome indicate that this Clement was a younger contemporary of Peter and Paul. He eventually became Bishop of Rome. Clement, who became the third Bishop of Rome, was an apostle himself, testifies Paul's fellow worker and fellow combatant. Philippians 4, 6-7 Trusting in God can lead to unsurpassed peace. The Greek phrase translated as be careful for nothing means not to be unduly anxious, fretful, or concerned. Paul taught that the antidotes of anxiety were prayer and trusting in the Lord. They bring the peace of God which pass, passeth all understanding, and they help guard our hearts and minds against fears. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder J. E. Jensen shared an experience in which he and his family received peace during a time of sorrow. Quoting Elder Jensen, Our grandson Quentin was born with multiple birth defects and lived three weeks short of a year, during which time he was in and out of the hospitals. Sister Jensen and I were living in Argentina at the time. We truly wanted to be there with our children to comfort them and be comforted by them. This was our grandchild whom we loved and wanted to be near. We could only pray, and we did so fervently. Sister Jensen and I were on a mission tour when we received word Quentin had died. We stood in the hallway of a meeting house and hugged and comforted each other. I witness to you that assurance came to us from the Holy Ghost, a peace with pa which passeth all understanding and continues to this day. We have also witnessed the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost in the lives of our son and daughter-in-law and their children, who to this day speak of that time with such faith, peace, and comfort. End of quote. Philippians 4, verse 8, the admonition of Paul. Paul admonished the saints to think on 
meaning to give careful, continuing thought to, things that are true, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. When the prophet Joseph Smith cited this admonition of Paul in the 13th article of faith, he changed think on these things to the more active seek after these things. Elder Joseph B. Wurzland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discussed the admonition to seek after these things. Quote, the word seek means to go in search of, try to discover, try to acquire. It requires an active, assertive approach to life. It is the opposite of passively waiting for something good to come to us with no effort on our part. We can fill our lives with good, leaving no room for anything else. We have so much good from which to choose that we need never partake of evil. If we seek these things that are virtuous and lovely, we surely will find them. Conversely, if we seek evil, we will find that also. End of quote. Philippians 4, verses 9 through 10. Verse 9, the writer points once more, as in chapter 3, to himself, to his personal teaching. What things you both learned and received and behavior and heard and saw and heard of and saw in me. The God of peace shall be with you, men of large hearted charity and steadfast loyalty, dwell in God peace amidst all storms. Verse 10 Greatly was I gladdened, he writes, that now once again you have blossomed out in your thoughtfulness for me. Indeed, you were thinking of me in this way before you lacked opportunity to show it. The recent gift was the revival of the care for the apostles' wants shown by the Philippians at an earlier time. No other church had so markedly proved its gratitude in this kind. Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ. As Paul drew this epistle to a close, he thanked the Philippian saints for the sport for the support and care they had offered him personally during his trials. Paul had endured several challenges, but his faith in Jesus Christ sustained him. He said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Elder Paul V. Johnson of the Seventy taught that trials with faith can help us grow and progress. Quote, we don't seek out tests, trials, and tribulations. Our personal journey through life will provide just the right amount for our needs. Many trials are just, as nat just a natural part of our mortal existence, but they play such an important role in our progression. Sometimes we want to have growth without challenges and to develop strength without any struggle, but growth cannot come by taking the easy way. We clearly understand that an athlete who resists rigorous training will never become a world-class athlete. We must be careful that we don't resist the very things that help us put on the divine nature. Not one of the trials and tribulations we face is beyond our limits because we have access to help from the Lord. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. End of quote. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Paul's concern was his ministry, not his worldly possessions. Philippians 4, 15 through 18. Philippian saints had been most concerned about attending to Paul's temporal needs, not just in Philippi, but also in Thessalonica, Corinth, and Rome. Philippians 4, 19. Since the offering is a sacrifice to God, he will compensate it. My God will fill up every need of yours as yours have striven, as you have striven to to meet his servant's need according to his riches. Temporal and spiritual needs are together included in the promise. God's wealth contains all kinds of treasures, and glory points to heavenly consummation in Christ Jesus. Thank you for watching this presentation. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.